Well, we are well into Lent. Uh, it's that season that prevents us from going from Palm Sunday to Easter Day too quickly and too easily. Uh, and uh, I make no apologies that for several weeks in the life of the church, certainly this church, we walk the walk of Lent. I read in a, 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 a paper online a few uh, weeks ago that fewer and fewer churches are choosing to celebrate Lent at all and moving straight to sort of starting to wake up on Palm Sunday. Uh, not here and not while I'm superintendent. Uh, let me tell you my favorite Lent joke before I get to the serious business. Uh, a man sees a young lad sat on a wall sucking a sweet. And he stops and looks at him disapprovingly. He says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, sucking sweets. Don't you know it's Lent? And the boy quickly swallows the sweet, then turns cheekily to the man and says, don't care whose it is, they ain't having it back. <laughs> Drummers. Uh, a week or so ago, Helen and I went to the Kew Gardens Orchid Exhibition, which is magnificent. And then in a different sort of way, yesterday afternoon, we spent an hour in the garden, our little postage stamp thing at the back, which in spite of its small size, Helen tells me after many hours of working, I've only just begun. Gardens are wonderful places. According to Genesis, and it was picked up in more than one of our hymns this morning, according to Genesis, God created the world perceived as a garden. It's Eden, it's paradise. And when you walk round a beautiful garden in full bloom, well, it can quite take your breath away. Molly wouldn't go in her garden. The district nurse encouraged her to sit in it in the summer months, surrounded by colour and scent. It'll do you a world of good, said the nurse. But she wouldn't. In fact, Molly had never been in their back garden since the day she brought a cup of tea out to Reg and found him dead among the flowers he was tending. Gardens are beautiful places and sometimes poignantly painful places. So by the time we get to the Garden of Gethsemane, in the story of Jesus, we have to have in our minds the Garden of Eden creation story and alongside that, realizing that we're not in paradise anymore and this is a place of suffering and heart searching. And you see that in some people's eyes. Uh, when you walk through Kew or you go on a walk over the moors, the open gardens of this land, and you meet people with that faraway look in their eyes, and you know that they're just thinking deep thoughts. Because gardens are powerful places. They're evocative places. They open the floodgates of our memory. No wonder that so many crematoria choose to have gardens of remembrance round about them. And a servant in the house of the high priest, where Jesus has now been taken after his arrest, spots a man lurking in the background, hovering and agitated, and he walks over to him and he says, didn't I see you with him in the garden? And Peter's mind explodes. Have we ever been in the garden? Well, of course you say, we were chopping back bushes yesterday. No, in the 
biblical evolution of the story of Jesus, have we ever been in the garden? Thousands of followers of Jesus, you see, if we're honest, would have to say, well, actually, no, I don't think we have. Lots of us have witnessed miracles. Lots of us have heard Jesus' gracious word to us in times of need or exaltation. Lots of us have received the parables and found truth for our own lives. Lots of us have and will cry Hosanna, glory to the King of Kings. But many fewer of us have reached the garden in the Christian story. Uh, Look at it this way, out of the thousands of people who met Jesus, uh, a proportion, sometimes a significant proportion, follow him. So when he uh, feeds people, we're told there are 5,000 men there, presumably more than that, if you count women and children. Uh, On the occasion of the Sermon on the Mount, we hear that a great crowd gathered to hear him. But by the time he turns his face to Jerusalem and starts to say repeatedly, the Son of Man must go where he will be arrested and he will be, be beaten and finally be put to death. Then the crowd starts to disappear and tail off. By the time he gets to Gethsemane, there are 11 people with him. Eight hesitate. Only three enter the garden with him. And they fall asleep. It's like watching that dance or a Strictly Come Dancing m- marathon where you go on as long as you can and then as you tire in the dance you sit down leaving those more energetic to continue dancing until eventually spectators soon outnumber participants there's barely anybody there in the middle or it's like watching a game of poker which I know as good Methodists you're all very well into As the stakes get higher and higher and higher, more and more players fold their hands and come out of the game. In Gethsemane, there's virtually no one there. In Christian faith terms, some of us gather around the manger and we take a look at the infant Jesus And that's where we are 10, 20, 30, 40 years later in terms of our Christian faith. Infants looking at an infant. Some of us make careful study of the teachings of Jesus, but if we're honest, we have to say that our lives show very little evidence that we've actually heard or received that teaching in the sense that it shaped our lives. Some of us are caught up with the idealism and the profundity of the gospel and we remain forever idealists but not disciples committed to a world transforming faith. And yet, and yet if if you can't preach it in Lent, when can you? For every Christian, there is during the Lenten walk the invitation Are you going to come into the garden? And although it's a place where few people venture, it's actually a crucial place for the forming and the forging of Christian discipleship. And I want to mention three, and I promise you very briefly, themes of Christian discipleship that are too often neglected today. The first is that Gethsemane is a place of selflessness. Today there's just so much emphasis upon our feelings, us, our needs, our desires, what we want. 
even in Christian terms, whether we feel the benefit of being a Christian, whether it's doing anything for us. Too often our worship and the comments we make about it becomes almost entertainment. I didn't reckon much to that hymn today. It's all evaluated primarily about how we feel about it. Too often our Christian living becomes a mishmash of devotion and custom and habits, but it's not profoundly shaped by the gospel. Too often our Christian service is carefully calculated to consist of what we, well, we actually like doing anyway, rather than what we don't like doing, but we know we should do because it's right. It's all about us, our feelings, our time, our commitment, our likes, our dislikes. And therefore, the unpopular but necessary lesson of the Garden of Gethsemane is that there you see utter selflessness. In Jesus, we're reminded of how things really are, of who is who and what is what, and at the end of all things, what ultimately is of most importance. The garden shines a spotlight into our souls and illuminates every piece of self-serving play-acting and asks whether or not we can stay there. Not only is the Garden of Gethsemane a place of selflessness, but the second unpopular theme today is that it's a place of surrender. Have you ever played that uh, game 20 years ago? It was quite popular where after everybody had finished dinner and you were sat there drinking coffee, but you had this game where you had to justify uh, that if you were in a plane, say, or, uh, and there was only two uh, parachutes, why should you have one? And somebody would sort of say, well, I'm a minister, and they always used to say to me at that point, well, you just say your prayers then. <laughs> but if you ever played that game, and then you see the imagery I'm trying to build here, it's in the garden where the one human being who had more claim to live than anybody else in the game submits and surrenders to the will of God. It's in Gethsemane that Jesus fights with all the inherent, no, I don't want to do this. No, I needn't do this. No, there must be another way around this. And leaves it all behind because recognition that surrendering to the will of God is actually paramount. Not my will but yours be done must be the seven hardest words that human beings ever say and truly mean. So to surrender when you What you could be for God if you used your God-given talents is a hallmark of Gethsemane. Being in the garden is about handing over control of your life and cutting the Gordian knot of self-serving and handing yourself in surrender to God and saying what you want is actually more important than all these other things. And that's deeply counter-cultural. The third lesson from Gethsemane that's an unpopular theme today is that it is a place of suffering. Now, I'm either brave or stupid, and probably the second, to introduce as a third brief point in a sermon a topic like suffering. How on earth can you do justice to it? But I want to come at it at a particu- in a particular way because In a sense, we don't know what to make of suffering nowadays, if ever we did. But our advertising suggests that life should be permanently bronzed, permanently on a cruise, 
permanently putting money away for our retirement, uh, permanently having flawless skin or size six dresses. It's all about putting things right in this rather false and flimsy view of how things are meant to be perfect. Our obsession with perfection means that at one level, all illness, all weakness, all abnormality is viewed as something to be eradicated and put right. And yes, I am a supporter of anyone who is seeking cures for cancer, etc., etc. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not arguing that all that's all right. What I'm saying is this. In Lent, we see ever more clearly than ever before the necessity of redemptive suffering or suffering that pursues truth or sacrifice or self-giving and recognizes that you can't do that and be absorbed or removed from the suffering involved in it. That inevitably suffering comes by seeking to heal, by seeking to love, by laying down your life, by having something you believe is worth dying for. Suffering comes about not because you actively seek it. Who does that? But it arrives because of your commitment to the truth or because you involve yourself with the lives of others who are suffering or because you won't tolerate how life is and you cannot sit down and keep quiet. And the life of Jesus bears witness to the key place of suffering in life and faith. And you can't read the gospel and believe that there is a gospel without suffering. Whereas we sometimes act that if there's any suffering, then it can't be the gospel and it can't be God's will. Gethsemane, the garden of Gethsemane, sees the Son of God in torment. For some people, that is theologically impossible but it's actually at the heart of Christian faith that's the scandalon from which we get the word scandal the scandalon of the Christian faith and to many it's still a stumbling block how can the innocent son of God suffer how and how can I suffer and it still be in the purposes of God Too often we want life without the pain of childbirth. We want eternal life without anybody having to die. We want to ride into Jerusalem and be raised to life without the trauma of Holy Week. And we want resurrection faith with a bloodless cross and no garden of suffering anywhere in sight. Have we ever been to the garden or is ours a faith without tears because ultimately Lent knows nothing about faith without tears the New Testament knows very little of that kind of Christianity because it takes faith and courage to enter a place like Gethsemane Because it's in places like that that we're reminded that being a follower of Jesus Christ is not a hobby. It's in the garden that disciples find issues are clarified and souls are forged and decisions are made and struggles come to resolution and the will of God becomes more known and strength is given when you least expected it. And Jesus is known more completely than we might ever think possible. Which is why when you go to some of the most persecuted and suffering and poor groups of Christians in the world and you ostensibly go to minister to them, you come away realizing who has ministered to who. But, as I close, and it's a very big but, so please hear it, but... 
we are not in the same situation as Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, his disciples leave him or sleep. But he today does not leave his disciples and he doesn't fall asleep. So actually the question should be not have you been to the garden, but in your lives have you ever walked in that garden with him? And the with him makes all the difference in the world. Jesus says to us in times of our own suffering and trial and the call of selflessness is potent upon us and costly. Come with me. It's a hard place, he says. But come with me and we'll walk through this time in the garden together. You can't know what will happen, but you can know that I'm with you. This Lenten season, the call comes again, though few of us relish it, including your preacher, where Jesus asks, will you come into the garden with me? Will you take seriously selflessness, sacrifice, and redemptive suffering or how you use suffering in your life? Or put another way, Jesus is saying to us, now as you go as my followers through this Lent in 2019, Are you going to be my shape or are you trying to make make me your shape? His way of being obedient to God is the way of Gethsemane and the cross and finally the resurrection. Our way is, well, just isn't any of those things. But to all who desire to walk with him, for all those who are tired and know that the only strength that they've got is putting themselves into his care again, he will show the way and give the strength. Onward to Jerusalem, 